I'm Brittany Packnett Cunningham. I am an educator, an activist, and a writer, and this is Aspen Ideas. I am so excited that we get to be in conversation with the one and the only leader, Stacey Abrams. She is the former minority leader of the Georgia State House of Representatives. She is the founder of both Fair Fight and Fair Count, focusing on ensuring that we vote and that we're counted in the census. And she is an all around bad black woman. Thank you so much for joining us, Leader Abrams. Brittany, it is my honor to be in conversation with you. I know that we have seen each other in so many places, and usually it's a 30-second chat, a 60-second chat, but we really get to dive deep today, and I think that this is the time to be doing it. We are standing on the precipice of such incredible transformation, and I know I am preaching to the choir here because you have been in the middle of so much of it, but we are really experiencing the confluence of events, right? We are experiencing most certainly a pandemic, a righteous um, a righteous rebellion and revolution against racial injustice. And we have seen so many of the inequities and injustices that already existed not be erased by that confluence of events, but be highlighted and exacerbated by that confluence of events. I'm really excited to talk to you in this moment, though, because what we have before us is not just a set of profound inequities, but a profound opportunity to move forward. And as the deepest inequities in our society have been laid bare in this moment, I really wanna know from you, how are you thinking about both what this moment is telling us about who we are and what this moment is calling us to be? You ask really simple questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you're brilliant. I'm I, trying to get all of it out. <laughs> I begin by thinking about why I do the work I do, why you do the work you do. It is not because we believe in instant results. We, we know that these are tedious, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching issues that we have to grapple with. But we also know that progress is possible. It just tends to be accompanied by these moments of regression and by an amazing amount of tension around what should be. People agree that we need to move, but there isn't always common agreement about what that looks like, what it sounds like, the shape it has to take, and how quickly it can happen. I recently wrote a book that uh, came out uh, this in this month in the month of uh, June, and the title, in my you know unexpectedly, I think is a bit prophetic, which is that our time is now, and where I stand in this conversation is that we are at, we're at inflection points on so many things. As you mentioned, the COVID pandemic is an inflection point that reveals the historical inequities, particularly in the allocation of healthcare and resources in communities of color. We have watched as Blacks have had double the rate of COVID infection and death, but we also know that the economic perils associated are also hitting our communities hardest. But I also remember listening to and talking to the Navajo Nation that had the third highest infection rate because of the disinterest that we have seen from this administration. We know that Latino rates of infection are going up and that no community is immune. And so we're at this inflection point where we have to talk about what it means to be American and to take care of one another. At the same time, we're grappling with the conversation about police brutality, which is a symptom of a larger system of racism. And so I don't want us to get caught in this notion that if we reform the behaviors of brutality, we have now fixed the problem. I talk about it as reformation and transformation. We are in a nation where reformation is going to have to be a part of what we do. We are not at a place where everyone agrees with the fact that we have to fix everything, but we are at a moment where there is common cause about fixing the most egregious. But we also have to then hold our leaders accountable for making sure there is a transformational conversation that happens at the same time, and we don't allow reformation to displace or overshadow the responsibility of transformation. I think that's so critically important, not allowing reformation to overshadow the possibility and the conversation and the work that it will take to engage in transformation. I want to talk to you a little bit, though, about what you were referring to in terms of the roots of the issues, right? You are a daughter of Mississippi. That is also where my people come from, um, on my dad's side of the family. And when I think about the work that our ancestors had to do, the, the ways in which they had to envision and imagine a future that they could not touch yet 
And if some of them didn't even live to see, I am inspired, I am motivated, I recognize my privilege in this moment, and I recognize my responsibility. How have your roots led you to a place where um, you are engaged in this fight no matter what it takes? I, I get asked often the question of what are you optimistic about? Why? What gives you hope? And I think back to the fact that you know my parents are examples of progress. My mom is the only one of her siblings to finish high school. My dad is the first man in his family to go to college. And he went to college despite having dyslexia that was undiagnosed until he was in his 30s. So my dad had to memorize his way through school. My mom had to fight her way through life. But their parents were domestic workers and cooks. My great grandparents were uh, sharecroppers and before that slaves. And so we have to think about the fact that the progress is it sometimes feel, feels plodding and mean, but it is real. And I had this privilege in 2018 to become the first black woman to be the gubernatorial nominee for a major party in American history. I may not have gotten the job, but there is something about coming from the roots of Mississippi, being in the deep south state of Georgia, and being able to say that this is the progress we've made. My understanding of this moment is that I don't have the luxury of giving up because the slaves that birthed me, they did not have the chance to give up. The grandparents and great grandparents who fought for the right to vote, who fought for the right to be seen and be respected. My parents who were civil rights activists as teenagers, they raised me to say, you fix the problems. You don't simply get to lament, you have to do. And that yeah. obligation, that responsibility is what drives me every day. I always say that our ancestors did far more with far less. So who are we to stop now? I could not agree with you more. And and we when we talk about the doing of this moment, the action that we need to be engaged in, each and every one of us, whether you are involved in politics, you run a household, a church, whatever it is, action is needed in this moment. And I think that because of the work of you and so many others that we've seen in over the last few generations, but in particular over the last few years, um, we this. America, the world is now at a moment where folks are taking action. We pe we see people joining book anti-racist book clubs. We see folks deciding to curate their social media very differently and audit who they're listening to and bring in new voices. We see um, leaders and thinkers being able to sell books that they have never been able to put atop a bestsellers list, right? So we see people beginning to take action. And we know that there are multiple kinds of action that are, are is necessary right now. I talk often about the importance of protest and policy, not or policy or protest and then policy. We understand that all of these actions work together. But back to your race, because you took action and you put yourself in the arena. And for those of us who watched, I mean, I was even down at Spellhouse Homecoming, passing out leaflets, right? I mean, so many of us were excited and engaged and so hopeful in that moment. And then to watch the outcome of that election was deeply frustrating for so many of us who said, yes, there's been progress and we're going to put our hand to the plow and continue this action. But what we saw in Georgia during your race is not new, right? It is um, what we experienced was a, the latest in a long line of the kind of disenfranchisement and suppression that has been rooted in this country for a long time. So help us understand exactly how we got here. That if, 2000, uh, if 2020 is just the latest chapter in this book, how did we get to this place where voter suppression, voter disenfranchisement is still a part of the conversation? We have to think about this in two spheres. We have sort of pre-21st century voter suppression and post-21st century voter suppression. From the inception of our country, we had a voter suppression model that was baked into the system. The Constitution is an act of voter suppression. It said that, yes, you have this right to vote, but it then disenfranchised every community except for white men. And even within that, only landed white men were really able to vote. But blacks were not human, Native Americans were not citizens, women were silent, and the 1790 Naturalization Act ensured that nobody else was coming or could, could access the perquisites of citizenship. You fast forward through you know, time and the, the anguish of the Civil War, you get to the 15th Amendment that, yes, gives blacks the right to vote, but it gives black men the right to vote, and what it also does is it devolves, as it always has, it devolves to the states the right to administer elections. And so by the time the Reconstruction has ended, 
the states have the authority to rescind what the Constitution has given, led by the Mississippi plan, which basically said, we're no longer going to say you can't vote because you're black. We're going to create all of these other ways to impede the 15th Amendment's adoption. You have the 19th Amendment that gave white women the right to vote, but not, white, not black women. And it wasn't until 18, 1965 that we truly had the right to vote for all people. And even then, there were still impediments for Latinos and Native Americans. And that took the 1975 reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. So you have this long arc of history. And around 1975, we start to see true engagement. We start to see true evolution. But then we run into 2008, when way too many people of way too many backgrounds decided they deserved to be heard and elected Barack Obama. And that started the 21st century wave of voter suppression. That was when we saw North Carolina eliminate Sunday voting because too many black people used it. We saw states across the country start to cordon off who had access. And then we had the coup de grace, which was the 2013 Voting Rights Act evisceration by the Supreme Court. When that happened, it gave carte blanche to every state that once operated with this ignominious belief that blacks should not be heard. They were able to now use administrative rules and barriers to voting with this you know, semi-facially neutral uh, methodology, but they were able to block the right to vote. And this is how they do it through voting. So can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you cast a ballot and does your ballot get counted? And we know that across the country, both the former Confederate states and states that simply do not like the evolving composition of their electorate, we have seen states put in place these rules and barriers. We know that in Texas, you can vote with your gun license, but you can't vote with your student ID. In Wisconsin, you have to have someone witness your absentee ballot, even in the midst of a, of a quarantine. In Florida, we have the challenge of absentee ballots being rejected at a higher rate. And in Georgia, we have just the wholesale breakdown of the systems. But this is a national crisis that is solvable, but only when we understand that because federal government devolves to the states the right to administer elections, we can't solve it simply at the federal level. We have to understand state by state how voter suppression works, but it all has the same architecture stopping you from registering and staying on the rolls, stopping you from casting a ballot. And if they can't get that done, making sure your ballot doesn't count. And when you talked about voting in your book, Our Time Is Now, which I agree is aptly named, um, you said that voting is an act of faith. It is profound. And in a democracy, it is the ultimate power. We are now currently talking about all of these incremental fixes that need to happen that are hugely substantial, but it is piece by piece, moment by moment, state by state, as you're saying, not just at the federal level. And for so many folks, they can get bogged down in the weight of doing that and how long it takes and how detailed it is and how closely you have to be paying attention to things you may not have even been thinking about, but you call voting the ultimate power. So this is Aspen Ideas. When you think about your most radical imagination about what the state of democracy and what voting can truly look like in this country beyond all of the piecemeal details, what do you see? What, what is our greatest aspiration in that space? What are we working toward? So I want us to do what we know works, which is same day registration, universal automatic registration, the elimination of prison disenfranchisement. We need to ensure that at the age of 17, you are automatically pre-enrolled to become a voter the moment you become 18. We have to have the full panoply of opportunities. Vote by mail, but we know that not everyone wants to vote by mail. So making sure we have vote by mail, in-person early voting and voting on election day. We need voting centers that can minimize the necessity for precincts so people can't be pushed out of the process because the place closest to them shuts down. Give them a place where they know if they can get there, they can vote. But we also have to wrap into this a decade-long push towards the census. Every single decade, we forget that this incredible instrumentality of our future is going to be put to work. And then we scramble in the last couple of years trying to make it work. And as we know, the hardest to count communities are the ones that are the most desperate for this progressive power, for this access to democracy, and they're kept out of the process and out of the conversation. In this year, it's been weaponized by the Trump administration in ways we have never seen before. But we know that as the country continues to change, as demography drives us towards a diversity we have never seen before, 
The census is always going to be seen as dangerous to those who want to keep us as a homogenous nation. And so we have to not just think about the act of voting, but we have to think about how the inputs of voting, what happens in the census decides the political districts from school board to Congress. And so we also have to believe that the census is an annual responsibility, that every year we're talking about it, demystifying it, explaining it, and connecting it to the decisions made. Whether it's the lack of PPE in communities of color because they were undercounted a decade ago, or whether it's the fact that a school board member gets elected in a district that is not representative of the population that he or she tries to serve. We have to be able to think broadly and long term, but we know what the mechanics are. We just have to own them and push them forward and remove artificial barriers. So can I keep it real with you for just a second? Or yes. Just a I want to ask a question for all of the folks that I love and care about deeply that I know you do too, who are not choosing between one candidate or another. They are not choosing between voting yes or no on a ballot measure. They are choosing between whether or not they're going to stay on their couch because a system that has always counted them out is not going to change anytime soon and whether or not they will go and stand at the ballot box, not actually fully believing that this system will work for them. And I think so often we have conversations about voting without recognizing the legitimacy of that complaint, the legitimacy of that frustration. There are folks who've been told we can vote our way to freedom that still aren't free. So they feel like they've been sold a bill of goods and they look at a system that was never built for them to, to succeed in the first place, as you have so eloquently laid out. And they're saying, why should I participate? I've been suffering for this long and still figuring out how to make it. So is this actually going to have any effect? What do we say to those folks in our lives who have legitimate frustrations with this system, but who we need to participate anyway? We begin by saying you're right, that voting is hard, it's tedious, and it is not a panacea. This voting isn't a magic pill, and there is no savior candidate that you're going to pick who's going to make the world perfect. It's just not going to happen. Politicians are human. They are people who are frail and who make mistakes, and they are going to fail you, even the ones you love the most. So we first need to admit that. But then we need to understand that voting is more like chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Mm -hmm. Racism is a disease. Systemic inequities, that is a, a, a cancer that has metastasized in our, in our world. And so our responsibility is to recognize that the act of voting is it's radiation therapy, but it's going to hurt. It's not always going to work. And the evil that you're trying to excise, that cancer is going to metastasize and recur. And so if you think that if you do it a few times then it's going to get better, it's not. But we have to stop lying to people and telling them that that's what happens. I run for office not because I believe the only way to solve the problems is to be in office, but I know it's one of the best ways to make people do the things I think we should do. But it's why when I'm not in office, I'm always running organizations and building infrastructure because I know voting isn't enough, but it is an essential part of the process. And when we abdicate that part of the process, everything else we're doing has less effect. And so it's like having to take a combo of drugs. We've got to take the voting. We've got to take the protest. We've got to take the census. We've got to protest and we've got to demonstrate, but we've got to protest at the ballot box, protest in the streets, and we have to make certain that the resources we need to keep the protest alive come to us through the census. And so what I want people to understand is that there is no one shot fix. And yes, you are absolutely right that you have not been told the truth. The truth is this, it can get better, but it will not get better if we abdicate our responsibility. I don't vote because I believe it changes the world. I vote because I know silence absolutely doesn't. Mm. That's it right there. So we only have time for one more question. And honestly, this is a selfish question because it's the question I keep asking myself. It is the question that Dr. King so famously uh, titled his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? We've had conversations about what the problem looks like, about the many ways that the cancer of racism and systemic oppression uh, metastasizes and manifests in our lives, not just in America, but around the world. So what do we do about it? There are folks who say, 
There, a lot of the primaries are already over. There are folks who don't actually trust their local, state, or federal government to create the kind of systems that will keep them safe during voting in a COVID world. There are folks who look at the entire system beyond voting and again say, this was never built with me in mind, so I'm just going to disengage. And there are folks who are trying to pull those folks back in but are struggling on exactly how to do that. So where do we go from here? What are the actions that all of us who are watching need to take from this point forward? So I think of the world in, in tertiary ways. One, we have to vote. And if you have questions, I created an organization called Fair Fight 2020. It's a national organization to help protect the right to vote. We have used the primaries to help us understand the broken pieces across 18 states. But if we understand those 18 states, we really do understand what's happening in the country. So visit fairfight2020.com to get more information. The census is essential because we're not just rerunning the 2016 election, we are rerunning the 2010 election. And that's the election that decides the whole game. It decides who writes the maps for the next decade. If you thought the last 10 years were hard, don't participate. So make certain we fill out the census. $1.5 trillion worth of allocated economic power and the political power of a decade. And then three, we have to fight for policy because it doesn't matter if you elect folks, if you don't hold them accountable for doing the things you demand. So we shouldn't just demonstrate in this moment. We need to be demonstrating when city council members are voting on a budget. We need to demonstrate when the state legislature is huddled over appropriations, but you also need to be in the Ways and Means Committee looking at their tax policy. We need to understand that government is not the president and the Congress. It is your state legislature. It is your governor. It is your mayor. It's your city council. These are the people who control the dynamics of our future. And if we hold them accountable by demanding not just policy, but policy implementation, policy accountability, and policy makers who see us, that is how we make forward. That's where we go from here. That's the work. Let's go get free. Leader Stacey Abrams, thank you so, so much for your time. And more importantly, thanks for everything you do. Thank you. It's been delightful.